Let some folk get in here. What's up, guys? Let a few more people jump in first and we'll get going. Any other comments here? No. What's up, Scholar? I did a refund for Scholar this morning. What? Scholar, did we do a refund for you this morning? <clears throat> Sorry, we're a few minutes late getting this live going. I was having technical difficulties, as you can imagine. So he oh. didn't get his camera tanner plates or or bolts he ordered. It was it was probably the tuner's fault. It's my fault. It's always the tuner's fault. It's my fault, Skyler. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so uh, special guest, at least for a couple minutes here. We've got Aaron in here today. Hey, everybody. Aaron Salisbury. Uh, so, you know, today's topic, I'll let uh, the Team GPI group, uh, I put a poll up and I'll let you guys kind of decide. And ultimately, the, the deciding topic for the day was, uh, is C85 better than E85? And we did fuels last week, so I don't want to bore everybody again with, with going over the same topic again. But in, in summary, yes, C85 is better than regular E85. So the topic we selected was the next highest voted topic, which was engine cubic inches displacement. You know, what's right for you? When do you want more? When may you consider less? Um, and, you know, you guys can fire away at questions. I can... We're, we're here to discuss our opinions on how we would build certain combinations um, depending on what the goals are, the end goal, what power adder is used, whether it's naturally aspirated. Um, tons of factors go into to, to building an engine, obviously, but uh, in our opinion, probably more times than not, more displacement is usually beneficial. It just depends. You know, when, when Ryan told me what the... Uh what the what the discussion was going to be about today the first thing that, that i thought of was you know i displace a lot more area uh, than than ryan does but when he walks in a room he sucks all the air out of it so <laughs> I, I i think that probably relates to it's you know big right. blocks and small blocks in some crazy way here so yeah you know, we'll, we'll we'll talk about that but you know in a nutshell i think for example, I had a 465 inch uh, natural aspirated engine on a dyno yesterday and made about 1100 horsepower. I'm gonna put a 585 cubic inch on tomorrow and it's probably gonna be about 800 horsepower. So, you know, different applications, different engine combinations. There's, there's always, uh, I mean, obviously, along with displacement comes additional mass, comes additional friction, different, additional area. Uh, it becomes harder to make power per cubic inch as the displacement gets larger. That's why, you know, some of these some of these small displacement uh, stop bottom end deals. Well, that and, and look at look at look at a Honda engine for God's mm -hmm. sake. I mean, it's things you know. I mean, three three horsepower per cubic inch is child's play on a on some of those engines. But yeah. you know, they're really really small. They're very efficient. The valve trains are very efficient, and so they get a lot more horsepower per cubic inch. I mean, we generally see. We've found it relatively easy to, to, to make, you know, 2.3 horsepower per cubic inch on these DI engines somewhere under 400 inches. But when you go over 400 inches, it becomes a little more difficult, a little more challenging. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to make overall more power, but it's always, uh, you know, consideration to be thinking about, you know, power per cubic inch as it relates to 
uh, you know, the weight uh, of the power plant, uh, what, uh, obviously the cost of building it, uh, higher RPMs, I mean, things get more expensive and, and uh, you know, you can take a big engine, turn less RPM and make a given amount of power. You can take a small engine, turn a lot more RPM and make a given amount of power. So these are all decisions you have to make, I think, on a build-to-build uh, -build basis. So that's, that's, a, that's actually a good, a uh, couple of good things you said at the end that, that kind of uh, makes me want to ask this question just for our viewers that don't that that don't know this uh, so the 1100 horsepower engine is ls power mm -hmm. um what cubic inch was that 465 inches 461 inches 461 cubic inch what stroke is that engine that's 4250 4250 stroke so a four and a quarter inch stroke and what kind of rpm do we turn that 9000 9000 times 90 i've seen 10000 on the log but uh, we 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 dynoted at 9000 but it generally shifts about 9300 right so my point is um a lot of misconception guys that i see on i would say the forums because i'm old but it's the the, the pages the facebook groups and pages is oh well, a long stroke engine i i want to turn more rpm so i need a shorter stroke um, it's really kind of relative to the whole combination, but don't let, don't think that a 427 with a four inch stroke can't turn 10,000 RPMs. It certainly can, um, or 9,500, whatever's practical for the rest of the combination. Just don't get fixed into believing that you've got to have a super short stroke engine to be able to turn RPM. And I see people give up a lot of power under the curve a lot of times, um, because they they don't realize that a long stroke engine can do the things it can do with the with the right combination of cylinder head and valve train design. Yeah, so. on a tall deck, I like a I like a four three seventy five stroke on a tall deck LS motor with a you know four one sixty five bore or something like that. I mean, I built those <laughs> things and turned nine thousand RPMs. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, obviously we we've known for years that nitrous engines, you know, you're limited by how much engine you have there to. to yeah. to pull in air it, it almost operates uh, uh well i wouldn't say like an na engine but it has to it has to pull the nitrous is cool and everything but it has to it has to pull that into the engine it's not forced well there's a limit to how much how many pounds of, of nitrous you can spray through a given amount of cubic inch so right. in the nitrous game it's all about packing cubic inch any way you can get it even though it yes. may not be that efficient so you can pack more stroke in a nitrous motor and it works for you. But, you know, get into super long, you know, crazy border stroke ratios on naturally aspirated engines, you do start to give up some stuff. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I've missed any comments here. People just watching. All the cubes. Yep, Dustin. We got him an engine underway right now. Nice. Uh, Kenny, some of the island boys over there, our Hawaii crew. Oh, cool. Island boys. Aloha. Yeah. Uh, chiming in. Uh, what's up, Alex? So is this why nitrous guys have these mountain motors? Exactly. And if you look at the turbo guys, um, they're almost opposite. You know, a lot of the turbo combinations aren't uh, nearly as big cubic inch wise. How um, much compression is too much to daily? Uh, well, Alejandro, that is relative to the fuel you run. And I can tell you, Looking at static compression ratio alone, say 13 to 1, 14 to 1, 15 to 1, isn't, um, you, you can't get just go by compression ratio. It's relative to the camshaft that's being used because the camshaft, depending on the valve timing, will lower your cylinder pressure versus a smaller camshaft will make the cylinder pressure higher. Um, we typically, Combinations we put together for E85, we typically run 15 to 1. We have absolutely no issue. And these cars get driven on the street, too. They're just E85 dedicated. So uh, it really depends on the entire combination. Um, all factors taken into account, but compression is your friend for sure. Yeah, and we've found, I think, direct injection will support a higher static compression ratio absolutely. than, um, than port yeah. or, or carbureted <laughs> for sure. Obviously, uh, Head material, I mean, obviously, you know, you can run higher higher compression ratio with an aluminum head. Yeah, you wouldn't want to do that with cast it. irons, that's no, for sure. No, no. Usually, <laughs> we usually, we usually leave about a, you know, make about a point lower on street driven stuff with, which we still believe it or not, do some iron head stuff at uh, Kingston Company. Yeah, Rashawn. So that's, uh, you know, as far as the nitrous goes, we learned this years ago, and you know, a nitrous combination becomes limited. Uh, either with cubic inch, camshaft, or just really what the engine can digest. And you start seeing that when you start peeling up, man, you start at 200 or 250, and 
bam, we're, we're good. We put 300 in, it picks up, good. We go 400, oh, didn't really pick up that good. Mm -hmm. Let's peel it up 450 or 500, and then yeah. you actually go the other way, or you know the car could slow down, may not pick up anything, but one thing's for sure, uh, it's not gonna be happy with it. Um, so yeah, yeah, your yeah, your total total pounds of uh, nitrous you can spray is is directly related proportional to the cubic inches of the engine, but the, probably the single most important uh, you know valve train event is is the you know, the exhaust open yep. on a nitrous cam. If you can't clear the chamber, bad things happen. You yep. pull all the time and you want out, you can fatten it up as much as you want. You you're, you're still going to burn stuff up. You got to get you got to get it. You got to clear the chamber. <clears throat> all right, Roberto. Does a stock LT block have anything to be concerned about when it comes to the relationship of bottom of the bore sleeve and bottom of the piston skirt on a 416 stroker? Seems like everyone goes 416. I've never heard of a 408 LT stroker, so I'm assuming there's not much to worry about there. Um, well, the reason I'll let Aaron talk about this uh, in depth because he's you know deals on the machining side of things more than I do, Obviously, we don't feel there's any concern with the pistons we use, uh, especially that JE piston has a nice yeah. skirt design on it. Well, the four-inch stroke on the stock, you're talking about a stock block with stock sleeves. There is a limitation to, you, you know, you're really hanging out a little more of the piston with a 4125 yeah. stroke crank than, than I prefer to do on a on a stock block, which is why we've never offered a 427-inch engine like some used to do, which was a, on a stock block, which was a yeah. you know 4070 bore and a 4125 stroke. and wind up getting a 427 out of it, but you got a lot of piston hanging out the yeah. bottom of the bore and it's just not a, a real stable engine. You're gonna have uh, accelerated uh, skirt wear and, and you know, it's probably gonna be a little noisy and it's just, but, just not a good combination. But what we do and we build the, the longer stroke engines, we're obviously sleeving those blocks. And when we sleeve them, we usually go with a uh, you know bigger piston and, and then we go with the longer stroke crank. When we say longer stroke, we're talking about over four inch stroke. Yes, over four, four inch. inch stroke four is inch fine in the factory block. Yeah. Um, and the reason you don't really see a 408 is because that would require some kind of funky stroke combination with a 4065 or 4070 bore to get to 408 cubic inches. You know, the older LS stuff that was 408 yeah. cubic inch was a 30 over 60 block, which was 430 bore and a four inch stroke. So right. that may be where you're thinking about 408 stuff. Um, but <clears throat> there are some in between stroke ranges, you know, an L8T crank, for instance, is 386 stroke. Uh, I believe. Yeah, and so you can build some, <clears throat> That's that gets you right at about 400 cubic inches with the L8T crank. I think it's 400 cubic inch 400, on the yeah, dot. 465 with the, yeah. Yeah. 38, but, um, 38, 386. Nothing to worry about with, with 416, four inch stroke. Uh, obviously, you know, if you're building anything over a 4070 bore, you're sleeving the block. So you've got an extended sleeve at that point anyways. Right. You know, 427, you know, which is a 4125 bore. And we built all the way up to 4185 bore on the naturally aspirated stuff. And we've done on LT block up to 4125 stroke so far. Yeah. I kind of um, like a, I kind of like a, a four, <laughs> 4185 bore and a four inch stroke. And some of that stuff. Yeah, but we like RPM. We, 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 we kind of like RPM. Unfortunately for a lot of the LT guys, you guys sometimes want to stay or most of the time want to stay with overdrive transmissions. And we're at limitation of uh, what we can get for a converter flash and uh, keeping lockup control happy if you're driving the car around and not having a setup that's so high end, you know, so so RPM friendly that it, nothing else is happy, you know, right. the automatic stuff so, or the overdrive stuff. So it's definitely a compromise. Ron and I battle that out all the time. I want to I want I want to spend it ninety five hundred. He says I can't I can't make transmission work with that. So no, I've no. Got to, so I have to I have to you know I have to concede. We have to no, no have complaints. To no complaints from me. Hey, I want to. All I I just say hey, I've never spun it ninety five hundred. So I don't want a guy to lose his legs on on on, on my trial and errors. But uh, in all seriousness, you know, <laughs> we have for, for years been able to get past um, the RPM limitations within the factory ECU, 8192. We can get beyond there. So we, we have turned the eight-speed stuff, you know, 84, 8500. So we're pretty comfortable with it there. We haven't had any concerns with it there. But, you know, again, everything's about building a, a balanced combination to work with the most power under the curve you have to work with. Uh, wherever that, if it's 7,000 to 9,000 or if it's 4,000 to 7,000, whatever. And engineering's all about compromises. If you're, right. gonna, if you're gonna get it one place, you're gonna give it up somewhere else. It's a matter of trying to uh, 
uh, find the find the best middle ground. Uh, all right, PJ, four sixteen stroker, high ram, stage three cam, Cali's crank, CID heads. What's the typical compression ratio? I'm thinking around fourteen and a half. Um, similar to the question earlier, I, you know, when we're building an engine like that, and it sounds like you've invested in a really good set of heads, so you're probably pretty serious about performance. Um, I wouldn't even start less than 14 to one. I mean, like I said, E85 combinations. Um, is that our stage three super, uh, NA cam, stroker cam, PJ? If so, I can tell you, I would be about 15 to one with that combination. Um, I would, I would try to put all the compression in it that you could up to, you know, 15, 15 and a half to one. If you're running on pumpy 85 or X85 or C85, any good ethanol, um, would be happy around 15, 15 and a half to one with that camshaft. No problem, Roberto. Yeah, stop block bores. Yeah, the, the stop block cylinders, you wouldn't want to run more than four inch stroke, really. You would have a lot of skirt hanging out the bottom. Uh, and it looks like we're caught up. You guys don't have any questions today. Come on with it. Nobody's, nobody's requested a... 600 inch big block yet? <clears throat> Probably we're, not this crowd. We're gonna, we're gonna dyno big block Friday. Man, but you said it was just gonna be a torque monster. Yeah, it's a bad street motor. You don't even sound excited about it's it. It's 10 to one. I mean, after pulling it's a- It's 10 to one. <laughs> after pulling an 1100 horsepower naturally aspirated LS <laughs> off the dyno, I mean, it's kind of yeah. hard to get yeah. super fired up about, yeah. you know, yeah. a 600 horsepower big block. All, all it's gonna do is strain the cherry picker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> nah, it's going to be a nice engine. But uh, I can tell you guys, uh, engines we have in progress on LT stuff and some of the uh, things to look forward to from us on those platforms, we have a 451 or 450 or 451 cubic inch. Can't name the customer. Not going to name the customers on these um, because some of these are in, in cars that uh, are going to be grudge guys. So I've got out of respect to those guys. But I want to tell you, we have a 454 cubic inch engine in process. We've got a 450 or 451 cubic inch engine in process, a 440. We've done multiple 427s, uh, 434 cubic inch, obviously 416s. These are all LTs. So uh, lots of things in the work. Our 9K package will be uh, in effect on a few of those as well. Um, so it's gonna be, yeah, we got, a, we got a 9K package shipping out to Australia to, so, to a road race team uh, later today. It's going to be a nice, I'm really anxious to hear some feedback from those guys. Yeah. And uh, there was a post in Team GPI earlier this week. Uh, me and Justin chimed in on it. It was like, uh, guys wanted to know when the TCM was going to kind of get unlocked on the C8 where we could turn more RPM and uh, where we could turn like 9,000 RPM. And Justin was like, well, we already may have cam, uh, you know, 9K package on the C8 right now. We may or may not already have that. So... Yeah, he still can't. Yeah, we have a nine cake package on C8, but we're not using it all. We're not using it all right now. We're, we're, <laughs> we're just, it's it's just there for right now. What's well, up, friend? Uh, yeah, his mid range torque. He's really pleased with his uh, power curve on that thing. Hey guys, it's uh, appreciate you having me. I'll let Ryan undo whatever bad information I gave you. I've got an appointment. I got a I got a skedaddle. Thanks for thanks, thanks for thanks for coming in for a few minutes. Right, see you guys. Uh, any benefits in stock stroke six one twenty five rod? Um, honestly, I'm going to be completely honest with you on a 362 stroke, uh, LT and LS stuff. The factory has the rod ratio figured out pretty good. I don't think that there's going to be, you know, you, you're not changing rod length very much. I mean, you're talking about 6098 to 6125. It's going to change the rod ratio a little bit. Um, I don't really, Chris, I don't really think that you're going to see anything, uh, to the good or bad with that, honestly. It's not a, a, a real coarse change like you're going to a 6200 rod or a 6300, you know, something, or a six inch rod. What's the largest displacement LS we've built? We've got one underway right now. Um, hey, what's a, um, um, I'm trying to say how, how to say this without incriminating anyone. Um, our longtime customer that we're building the big NA engine for, what cubic inch is that? 504 or six, something like that. 50 and some change, 504. Yeah, 500 five, it's 500 inch. It's, you know, uh, we'll probably limit that thing to a four, eight. Six, a, a 4185 bore 
and a four six hundred stroke. Do the math. Four one eighty five bore, four six hundred stroke. So yeah, I mean we'll we'll let you guys math that out. Somebody tell me in the in the chat here what that cubic inch is. I'm not gonna do all that math right now, but building it specifically to pull a hay trailer with. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So that's that's what we the probably the biggest LS engine we've got underway or have done is underway right now. Uh, a little over five hundred cubic inch. And we're still probably gonna turn that thing eight thousand or a little bit better. Uh, let's see here. I'd like to do a 416 someday. Wondering what my CIDs in your stage two stroker cam usually makes 14 to one compression. Uh, that's a pretty good question. I can tell you a 416 at about 15 to one with the same heads you've got and our stage three cam on C85 makes in the 720s on our dyno. So, you know, stage two cam, you got less cam, uh, a little bit less compression. I would anticipate, I would still anticipate probably 660 range, Frank, 660 to 680, maybe. Kenny, I know LT stuff is big right now, but I've got an LS question. But I benefit as much as people say I would on an LSA setup to buy a 62 LSA long block to replace my 60 engine. Uh, gonna be a SS3 PD cam and a 3800 4000 circle D stall converter. Uh, that's a pretty good question. Uh, I guess it really depends, Kenny, on how hard you're gonna spin the blower. Um, what what kind of, uh, how max you want the performance. I don't think you're gonna see a ton of gain switching from 364 cubic inches to 376 cubic inches um, with all else being the same. I don't think that there's going to be a, a ton of uh, change in that. The bore will help the power a little bit. Of course, the engine is the same stroke, so all the benefits are going to be from the engine bore, and I don't think it's going to be um, a ton, honestly. And you said it's going to be a pump gas car, so you're probably not going to be running super crazy boost or crazy amounts of air flows. I just don't know that you'll see a, an absolute ton. What you will see with the LSA is obviously it's got a nicer crankshaft and a nicer set of rods and um, lower compression set of pistons, so you can push it harder than you can uh, your engine that's currently in your car. Roberto says he always has questions. That's good. That's what we're here for. Do the GPI drop-ins buy you a little more valve relief over stop pistons without fly cutting? Say a combo like SS3 or SS4, unmilled heads and a 40 gasket. Is that probably good to go? Um, yeah, so one of the things when I had, when I dreamed up the drop-in piston to have Diamond design that for us was I specifically told them I wanted to have 200 thousandths deep valve reliefs to allow for the larger cams that we run and normally would have to fly cut a lot for. So... Our track attack high ram cam, normally when we do max milling on CIDs and run the thinnest gasket we can possibly run, like a 28, normally I'm fly cutting in between 175 and 200 thousandths. So the, the drop-ins come with 200 thousandths relief. So you can mill the heads actually a good bit, uh, thin gasket, and get away with a SS3 or SS4 cam. You're not going to have any problems. You're going to have clearance to spare by a long shot. <clears throat> what do you think about a small dry shot on a 600 wheel SBE on all LT4 fuel system and pump E? Can the rest of the fuel be programmed through injectors? Um, I do have enough fuel uh, fuel system for the dry shot. Do I have enough fuel system for the dry shot? Uh, 75 to 100 dry shot. So yeah, I can tell you LT4 fuel system, as long as you've got an aux pump uh, on the low side, you should have enough high side fuel system to make uh, over 750 wheel. So you, you have enough fuel system there to make that kind of power as long as you've got enough low side, AKA with like an aux pump. Um, so yeah, you should be good with that light. And yeah, it can be programmed, you know, the, oh, I've never was a super fan of the dry shots, um, for guys you know, they spray it across the math and it adds fuel enrichment with that. And that's, I never really was super fired up about that. But I mean, you certainly could um, do it that way. I don't know how accurate that's going to be on the you know, fuel enrichment. Or you could, uh, you know, have a separate tune that had the fuel enrichment in it. 
Um, and it's not going to take an additional, you know, a ton of fuel enrichment for, you know, 75 or 100 shot. It's not going to be just a crazy amount of fuel. Yeah, Frank. So, I mean, the power you make now is good and probably not terribly far from where you would be with that 416 you were talking about. I think the big benefit on the 416 stuff is power under the curve. All the uh, under the curve power under, you know, the peak torque and everything you pick up, which in turn helps a lot of things on our overdrive cars. It helps our converter uh, loosen up and uh, just overall acceleration is going to be better. Uh, when you make more torque like that. If you don't have a converter to get you in the promised land with your with your current setup, you know. I'd like to do a 4185 and 3.9 stroke 427 LT2 for C8 if they can handle that stroke. I've heard they don't have as much clearance on stroke as the other LTs. Yeah, so the we didn't pay... Uh, a ton of attention. Well, we didn't disassemble the short block on the one that we did the cam on um, or really dig into seeing what we had clearance wise there. I mean, I'm sure you can run three, nine or four inch stroke on that stuff. Certainly are going to have to do some things clearance wise with windage tray. I'm sure we even have to on uh, the current LT stuff for, uh, you know, C7s and six gens. Need a four, uh, 427 cheater cam package. Uh, we can, I can do a custom cam. That's not a problem. Yeah, 540s at your weight, Frank, is rolling. That's good. For SBE setup at your weight, that is getting busy. Butch, hey, uh, shifting gears for a minute off of cubes. I have been trying to find a solution for low side fuel on a truck. So when y'all do the 2650 and drop ins, it can be turned up a little. What say you? Um, Butch, I'm kind of a fish out of water right now on the 19 newer stuff. I don't know what the go-to fuel system solutions are. Hopefully, if anybody's in the chat um, knows, drop in you know, in the comments what some fuel system solutions are. Certainly, I can have Kevin check around on that a little bit as well. We could always do some kind of auxiliary pump. That's not an issue. Uh, it'd be cool if they had a drop-in solution, though. We'll dig around a little bit on that bush and see what we can come up with. No problem, Kenny. How far can I mill my heads before fly cutting? Uh, it's going to depend on what cam is in it. Uh, stock LT heads. Yeah, it's just going to depend on what cam is in it. So... Looks like we're catching back up on questions. Uh, no Choco Cam, you should be able to mill like uh, at least 40 or 50 and run a 40 gasket. You mentioned on the poll possibly discussing turbo or blower preferences for the street. Could you briefly go over that? Yeah, um, I think it's, I think the main determining factor for me is you know, the overdrive guys, um, eight and 10 speed stuff that would want to be turbo prospects are going to need to go with a trans brake because they're going to need to spool that. Um, they're going to need, you know, the ability to spool to really launch the car or truck. Um, and, and for that reason alone, almost, um, I tend to prefer the 2650 Maggie stuff. Just because it's, we've made big power with that blower. Uh, not to say that a turbo won't make more. Certainly turbos are going to be capable of making more power than a PD blower. It's just not very, very often at all that people want to make more power beyond what a PD blower will make. And a lot of the racing we do, um, you know, for a lot of the late model overdrive stuff is like foot brake classes and just daily driver type cars. And we typically, you know, will run supercharged and nitrous combination on those. And that is a very hard combination to beat. Uh, certainly turbos would be the ultimate, but like I said, you got to have a trans brake solution uh, to be able to spool a car. And that's, to me, that's the main determining factor. What's up, Daniel?
We got a heavy tire, guys. I don't know why. <clears throat> Waiting on some stuff to come in here. I had some problems getting the live started today, so I don't even know if all the people that were interested in looking at this got the notification that I was live. I couldn't start the live from within the event. Uh, I think I set it up wrong when I set it up Monday. I don't know. You know. <clears throat> what do you think M5 would drop on an NA? Uh, no Chapo setup. Uh, ET-wise, I think you'll pick up two or three tenths. Thanks, Ryan. I've called everyone. I'm aware of no one has a drop in low side, at least for plug and play setup. Yeah, that's what I was kind of afraid of, uh, Butch. We'll have to keep digging a little bit on that. Um, Daniel, what do you think on the 373 for the A10? Personally, I think it's way too much gear. Um, we played with the 373 diff, uh, some on the eight speeds, and even on the eight speed cars, um, they were quicker with the. Uh, they were quicker with the 277s. So what you have to consider, Daniel, is, yeah, you don't have a ton of rear gear like our old conventional wisdom. You know, we put more rear gear in it. But most of those transmissions back in our day were one-to-one -one ratio where these things are overdriven, you know, three, four times. And we have such more aggressive trans gearing that the rear gear is a lot less important on um, – on our eight speed and 10 speed stuff and six speed stuff as well. Um, any advice for centrifugal and six speed manual for the street? Um, you know, it's just going to come down to good old power management. You know, you've got an added, uh, the added factor of clutch. So that, that could be a benefit, you know, because you can control your launch RPM. The problem is going to be consistency with the manual car on the street, you know, I think all manual cars, in my opinion, that don't have a slipper clutch or something, you know, crazy, you know, high end like that, are going to be better off with running a 15 inch stiff wall slick with a tube in it. You're going to have to have the car have some wheel speed uh, to not fall on its face. And typically a stiff wall slick with the right compound and a tube will give you a good stiff sidewall and, uh, you know, let you control the wheel speed a little bit. What are your thoughts on the new BTR LS3 canned valve heads coming out compared to other options currently available? Um, we've actually engine dynoed our Max 2.0 head against that LS3 head. Um, I don't, A, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. B, I don't know that I'm really at liberty to say what the results were from that other than saying um, that head should be a pretty good head. And when it comes out, I would look forward to getting those castings and us doing some port program uh, stuff for that probably. Um, you know, there are, you know, obviously there are going to be some guys with, um, LS3 combinations that may want to stay with their LS3 intake uh, and stay with, you know, not have to change as much stuff up. So it's going to be a good head. It's going to be a good LS3 head for sure. Um, Yeah, Roberto, the, the extra uh, piston and valve clearance is one of the key things about the drop-in. Not only did we want to have a piston that would handle anything, any kind of abuse people wanted to throw at it, it would have the piston and valve clearance to be able to run aggressive camshafts. And I'll be the first to admit, it's not even the greatest NA piston. And I say that because it was really developed for power adder stuff in mind. And with a power adder, we're typically going to have a heavier um more robust ring package than on an NA car. On an NA car, it's all about lightweight and being efficient. So we'd have thinner rings on an NA setup that we were custom building. So the drop-ins um, are very good for what they're good for. Um, 
and very versatile. You can run them in a or with a power adder, but um, you know, if you were purpose building a real Mac Daddy in in a engine, uh, we would put you in a different piston, uh, a different custom piston for for an application like that. Thanks, Daniel, on the shirts. Um, just sometimes we just brainstorm and we have these crazy ideas and we just throw it out there and see if it sticks. You know, I like to check with guys and see, hey, what do you guys think about this? You know, I may think it's a good idea, but unless a good group of you guys think it's a good idea, you know, that stuff may never see the light of day. So I appreciate the the, the feedback. We've certainly sold a, a fair amount of shirts already. Uh, we've probably sold near 100 of those things already. So it's it's been been pretty good, you know. What setup do I need to put a gap on Tyrone Mason? Just, you need one of them Mississippi bolt-on cars. One of the Mississippi bolt-ons. You know what that is? That's like a smooth idle um, stroker engine that runs on M5 and nitro. And, but you call it stock cubic inch and C85, stock cam. That's what you call it, though. You, don't, you can't say it's Mississippi bolt-on because then they're going to be on to you. You guys say it's all that stuff, so. For Century Car, looking to make low 900s to low four-digit numbers is 400 cubic inches more than enough and on low compression, say nine and a half to one. Uh, if so, what would a setup that can, what would be a setup that can do that effortlessly? Asking for a friend. Um, really, yeah, I mean, so you've got enough engine even at that compression ratio. So in the absence of compression ratio, obviously we're going to need to run probably higher boost um, to make that kind of power, but that's not a problem. As long as you're not blower limited. Um, superchargers we like in that realm. Um, really the only non-pro charger head unit i would tell you would be like a ysib you know or the 2200r you know they're, they're basically the, the same the billet wheel ysi and uh you know f1a94 obviously f1x would do it uh that would probably be my options and i know people are probably going to say d1x can do it as well it can, but you would have to spin a D1X pretty hard. Uh, you wouldn't have to work uh, the other blowers as hard, I don't think, as long as you've got a good, efficient intercooler core. What fuel system do I need to run uh, M5 on a 6th gen? Um, well, I don't know if it's cammed or what, but you're going to need basically, I'll tell you, if I was going to build one, to run straight M5, it would have a four triple pump system, probably with either three 450 pumps or three 525 pumps. And it would have, uh, I'd probably keep the, I'd put LT4 high side in it and I would run port injection. That'd be what I would do. Is there any future possibility of GPI LT track attack high compression pistons? Uh, I'm assuming maybe with higher compression starting point on the LTs, maybe the marker, market is just not there. Yeah, it gets kind of difficult. And, and what you get into, Roberto, is, uh, you know, to get high compression, that means the dome has to be pretty aggressive. So, and the problem with that is, you know, our CID head combustion chamber is going to be shaped differently than somebody else's CID combustion chamber. So when you get aggressive with the dome, if we spec'd it off of all our stuff and did molds off of our stuff, well, that may not fit and clear good on someone else's. So when you're getting really aggressive with the piston in terms of compression, it gets really difficult because it's it really has to be designed around a uh, particular combustion chamber because it has to tuck, you know, so... Thanks for the info on the heads. I would like to see the comparison between your offering and that head. Yeah, for sure. Um, hopefully we can post it up one day or talk about that a little bit more. I, you know, maybe I can now. I just don't want to, I don't want to do anything or step in on any toes or, or talk about anything I'm not supposed to talk about. Uh, but it looks like it's going to be a, a pretty good head for LS3 stuff. It's going C85 
over E85, E85 worth it on a full bolt-on car. Yeah, you're probably going to see about 10 horsepower, give or take just a couple numbers. Thoughts on a 4L80 and a max effort-ish in a 6th gen? Uh, that's a good one. Well, I think Tyler... I think it's probably going to be as efficient as the eight-speed stuff to turn. Um, I think the likelihood of having better converter options is better with it, and you could go to a 373 diff, so you could still have pretty good starting line ratio. Um, you could still lock the converter out there in third gear. But I really think, honestly, Tyler, the way the only way that, that the 4L80 would be more beneficial is – um, is if you had more rear gear in it. Like if you had the G-Force deal or something where you could put, you know, uh, a 430 um, or 456 or something like that in the rear, I think then it would get uh, more beneficial possibly. Um, you know, the beauty of the 8 and 10 speed stuff is being able to lock the converter pretty early and keep it locked on the shifts to keep uh, the efficiency up, the converter slip gone, and, you know, obviously mile per hour, you know, you see positive things with mile per hour when that happens. With a 4L80, you're not going to be able to lock it in a second and keep it locked on the 2-3 shift. The shift drop is just way too far. Um, so, for that reason, I don't know if a, a, four, a 4L80, you would have to, like, have optimal rear gearing to make it better, in my opinion, I think. Um, Daniel, I would say I like the Molly Pistons, um, on a lot of the stuff we do. I'd have to see, I'd have to put a compression calculator on it, to be honest with you. Um, I'd have to see what the piston volume is and see where the head volume needed to be to get to, to that. But myself or Kevin can figure that out. That's not a problem. Yeah, Andrew, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, on a 4L80, you're only going to use, you're only going to be able to use third gear. I mean, fourth gear is not really a, uh, not necessarily a really a pulling gear. So you got first, second, and third, and then you got converter lockup. And, you know, the, the gear ratio change between gear to gear, you're talking about 248 to 148 um, to one to one. So if, memory serves correct, locking the converter in second and shifting the 2.3 with it locked is almost like a 2,000 RPM shift drop. And that will just, an NA car is going to pull down on its face. Looking at 12 to 13 to 1. Yeah, the, so the, the heads won't have to be milled a whole lot uh, on a stroker setup with most flat top style pistons that have valve reliefs or that have small domes. So we shouldn't have to get too crazy with the head milling on that. Tyler, if you want to look, if you want to try to appease overdrive rules uh, and stay in an overdrive NA class deal, which I love, uh, and I love being able to work the rules and, and find creative ways to do things, Look at Extreme Automatics, uh, their 200 metric transmission, their 200R4 or 204R, whatever it's called. Um, they're kind of expensive, but uh, overdrive trans, uh, lightweight, um, probably got some gearing options with them. And, you know, the same holds true. Depends on how fast the car is going to be. A 373 gear may work okay for you, depending on the RPM and how fast the car is going to be. I can tell you right now, the blue car, I wish we had more gear in it. I wish we had a 410 or a uh, 430, but, you know, we could use a little bit more RPM with the Stripe. But, you know, 373 obviously is super convenient and relatively inexpensive because they come out of M6 cars. So... Um, gear vendor usually, it, 
does not pass for overdrive. So usually you can't run a power glide with a gear vendor or a three speed with a gear vendor. They, they aren't going to allow that as, um, as overdrive, uh, legal stuff. I don't really know why, but they really don't. But I think also on the overdrive stuff, what they try to do, you know, you're not just stepping gears, but basically most of the overdrive stuff is going to be foot brake, you know, or even if it's trans brake, a, even a 4L80 trans brake is slow, slow, slow compared to a fast turbo 400 trans brake. You know, a turbo 400 pro trans brake is fast. A power glide is fast releasing off the button to actual reaction is fast. A 4L80 is mega slow. Um, so they just don't in comparison. So I think there are other factors that they look at when, uh, when they look at saying what's legit for an overdrive class, you know, <clears throat> someone needs a real break for the A8. Yeah. I mean, I don't have any experience with the, with the getaway cars. One's the only one that I've seen out there. I don't really have any experience. We had a guy, a car come in, one had been done elsewhere and it had issues and we just ended up removing it and putting it back stock because it had drivability issues, shifting issues and everything with it installed. I don't know if it was something with the install or what. I just kind of, a trans brake is unnecessary for an MA car uh, with an eight speed kind of. It may net you a little bit quicker reaction time, but it's not going to make the car any faster. And that's where people, they think a lot of times that you're going to leave harder on the trans brake. You're not actually. The blue car, Corey's car actually was a couple hundred slower to the 60 foot with the trans brake than it was on foot brake. And we might could get that ET back if we move the, the launch RPM around a little bit, but you're not going to put a trans brake in a car and just go out there and throw it on the back bumper. It just doesn't work like that, you know? So. <clears throat> Anything else? Yeah, that's kind of what I've seen too, Anthony. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to say that, and you know, without having personal experience. But that's just what I've, I've seen as well. <clears throat> Um, I'll be honest with you, Roberto, we've been sending the transmissions, the eight speed stuff out to, uh, uh, eight and 10 speed stuff to circle D. So I don't really have any feedback or anything to offer. We build the six L eighties in house using circle D's kit. I don't really have anything to offer in terms of what to do on the trans build for the eight and tens though. Anything I would tell you could be possibly be misinformation because we just don't do them in house. Have we done any L83 NA setups? Yeah. Yeah, we've done some. Um, we do, you know, this area around here, Isaiah, is very, <clears throat> you know, daily driver type, not super serious truck stuff. So the ones we've done have been like your typical, you know, four, you know, low 430 range, 440 range rear wheel for E85 setups. <clears throat> we've got one uh, actually getting ready to dyno here before too long, like within the next day or two probably. And it'll be a pretty solid setup. It's got a high ram and stuff on it. So it should run pretty good. Yeah, Frank, a lot of people may not even, you know, for what you do with the car, you know, it's, it's relative to what your goals are, you know, but, um, that, sure, there are some advantages uh, with a stroker setup. And maybe if you ever have a failure with the stop bottom end and you've got to do a repair, then it'll probably be worthwhile considering doing a stroker at that setup. But I don't know. I mean, you've got a really good running combo. I don't know that I would go disturb that combo and <clears throat> just go for a stroker if you're not just racing the car all the time or, you know, have, have other reason to do that. Do you need to fuel uh, the comp spring for the fuel lobe? <clears throat> LT4 pump, 42% uh, fuel lobe. Man, 
I don't know how well you're going to control a 42% fuel load. Um, that's going to be tough. Um, a buddy of mine down in Texas uh, messaged me. Oh, it's probably been uh, a month, maybe two months ago, and was having some issues, and I just kind of recommended some tables to try in the tune to see if we could kind of uh, corral it. Uh, it was basically overpressuring. Um, at RPM, the pressure would climb well beyond commanded and just get out of control. Of course, when the pressure gets high enough, it locks the injectors up. They won't open. Uh, Chris, I don't know, 40, well, we've never tried a 42% fuel load, and the only person that I personally know that has tried one uh, that was over 40% had control issues with it, and I think he ended up going back to a 38. So, But, yeah, I would definitely run the comp spring with it regardless. Oh, for a 60-60 6-speed clutch? I'm not sure. The LT4 stuff is, I'm sure it's a little bit better. We don't. We don't do a ton of manual stuff here. Um, we have done a few of the monster clutch swaps, but I don't know exactly what they were, if it was using like the LT style clutch in some of the LS stuff. But man, we probably do three three to four clutch swaps a year, Roberto. I, we don't do many. And most of the stuff's all automatic around where we're at. <clears throat> yeah, Norm. So my plan is to do these weekly um, and, you know, I'm trying to schedule these a little further out ahead of time to get more people, more time to prepare to tune into the live if they want to. I know it's hard if I just drop that day that I'm going to be doing a live in four hours, it's hard to make time for that. But I'm trying to get to where I'm scheduling these about a week out ahead of time and, uh, you know, where we can better be prepared and, you know, I just want to try to keep the topics fresh, but I think your topic, next time I do a poll, Norm, and Team GPI about next week's topic, I think that would be a good one. Uh, and, and I'm happy to talk with uh, our particular opinion on crankcase ventilation, uh, how we plumb it, and why we do it that way. I think it would be a great topic. You know, maybe it may not consume a whole live, but it's something that we could get in one for sure. Is the new LT1 package Camaro a good to go Mississippi bolt on with? I don't know what you mean. Nate, uh, I don't know. It's got a L83. I'm going to throw it in A94S10. Yeah, the L83 stuff is makes pretty good power for the, for the cubic inch it is. Am I ready to go to some no prep races? Man, I like all kinds of racing for sure. <clears throat> yeah, Frank, it would be hard to justify it with, with what you're doing for the car usage-wise. Stage 2 stroke cam handle how much nitrous? Uh, most NA camshafts with that exhaust open event that we do on them, I would say probably 2 to 250. I wouldn't want to spray it past there. Beyond there, I would do more of a nitro specific grind. Yeah, Chris, I'm not sure. Um, I guess you're just gonna have to try it and see. I mean, it just it sucks to. Yeah, I don't know. Controlling that thing, you know, may become an issue. I even talked to a K Tech at PRI a little bit about um, control on different cam lobes and they kind of um, had the same opinion as us from the testing they had done as well. Let me know how that converter does, Frank. We've got one going out to a customer as well that does a pretty good bit of racing. So we're going to, you know, get some feedback and hopefully it's a big step in the right direction. It seems like you're open to trans talk. I was told keep my lower 373 gears in my classic car. It's going to cause the torque tables to mess up with the 
ALT1 combo. Is that the case or can't be tuned? So we have, I have tuned swap cars that had more conventional gearing, like a 373 or uh, 410s. And the only issue you're going to run into is the trans is just going to shift insanely fast. You know, you're going to go through the gear so much faster, uh, Lonnie, that it just may not be a good feel. You know, it just, it's going to, it's not going to spend a whole lot of time in the gear. There's not going to be any issue tunability wise that everything should be able to be tuned out and be fine. It's just that the trans is going to be so busy um, at low speed, just boom, 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 boom. You know, it's going to shift through the first four or five gears like that with a 373. That'd be interesting to see, Roberto. If you if you do that swap, I'd like to see uh, what the results were and what all it takes to do for sure. <laughs> what engine do I recommend for your car? Oh man, I don't even know. Probably the EV swap it. Um, crankcase ventilation on Gen 5 LT should absolutely be on the Q&A. Uh, it was somebody, somebody in the comments uh, suggested, Norm Molina. And, you know, it is a, a, a topic. You know, the front crank seal on the LT is the lip is not as strong. And it's very, it's it's easier to push that out than it was on the LS. So there, there are definitely things we could talk about there. LT-427 versus 416, how much of a power difference do they usually have? Um, all parts the same, compression the same, same cam, same heads. We've done this. There's about, um, about 25, roughly about 25 horsepower difference, give or take just a couple horsepower. And not quite that much torque, uh, close to that much torque, but not, not quite that much, Curtis. Hey, what's up, Brian? What can would you recommend me to put in my LT1? Uh, do not want to fly cut. Uh, I wouldn't go bigger than the SS3 if you did not want to fly cut. And of course, with the SS3, you're going to have to run a converter as well. No problem, Lonnie. What do you think about a 327 rear gear on the A10 to be able to leave in second? I thought about doing that. <clears throat> the problem you got to look at, uh, Mike, is where do you finish right now? Do you finish in fifth gear or do you have to get into sixth? And then kind of consider your gear, um, your, your gearing at the top side of the track for quarter mile stuff is what I'm talking about. For eighth mile, it's probably going to be a non-factor. Um, I think it's, I think it potentially could be good. We looked at this, and I was looking at starting line ratios, and I can't remember second gear ratio and first gear ratio, but it seemed like a 327 and second gear was going to be pretty close to a first gear and 277. I can't remember, Mike. I would have to look at the starting line ratios and do that math again. I considered it on a customer's car, but what I ended up being concerned with was having to make another shift out on the top end, and it you know, falling on its face out there is kind of what I was looking at. Yeah, our SB stuff's pretty nasty, and our stroker engines are, are really nasty. Um, just get ready to, I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, <clears throat> reasonably soon, you're going to see LT stuff make, uh, on our dyno, engine dyno, make over a 1,000 horsepower, uh, naturally aspirated, on uh, probably on E85, to be honest with you, just regular E85. It may have to have some kind of fuel mix. I don't know, but we'll do it. We're already super close, super, super close. Um, so with the 9K package, uh, the external oil pump and vacuum pump, we're going to be four digits. And nobody else is doing that, um, to my knowledge currently um so we'll see we better convert a manual throttle body or stay with electronic uh i stay electronic daniel <laughs> yeah ev swap anybody that knows me knows i'm bullshitting about ev swap 
you guys tried a 410 setup in the LT platform mainly for drag racing? No, because the trans gearing is so aggressive, a 410 makes the overall gearing way too aggressive. Um, so we haven't. You know, we found our best results with the factory rear gear on the 8-speed stuff. I haven't played with rear gear on the 10-speed stuff yet, but the 8-speed stuff, we were fastest with the 277 rear gear. Just thinking about the NFC cam, some compression, and big stall. What do you think? Um, you could do that. Um, you know, the NFC cam at 13 to 1 or whatever is a really good running combo with a converter. Uh, it's going to run and drive great. You know, either one of those combos will work well for you. So I'm playing a regular cab, short bed, uh, build. What's up? I'm still on here. He's back. I have spare LS3 chilling in my shed. Would your uh, Holly 4 be a good fit for it? Um, yeah, it would. You know, like I was talking about in one of our shorts or reels that we did on Facebook um, or a story or something like that, um, we were doing like little 60-second clips on our different camshaft lineups. And the beauty of the high lift cams is you don't give up a ton of performance versus not running dual springs. But, uh, you know, for a driver set up, you, know, you greatly reduce, you know, valve train maintenance. You don't have to worry about spring intervals really so much. And you get all the choppy chop benefits of idle sound. You still make decent power. So for most people, Frank, with a driver set up, the primary, you know, primary focus isn't performance. The low lift stuff works pretty good. How much nitrous can an LT427 take and what fuel do you recommend? Just depends on the setup. Depends on the cam. Depends on how good the heads are. Um, tons of variables. 427. How much nitrous our, have we put our, through a 427? Our, well, I mean, with our, um, with our big head, I would say with our big head and with an exhaust open somewhere in uh, low to mid 90 90s. degrees yeah. and uh, about 14 to 1 compression, I would hit that thing with about a 500 shot. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's probably going to be the upper end of what you're going to get uh, at that cubic inch. Let's see. Has it tends to be gotten better with the uh, 60 foots with the new converters? Uh, the new converters are, just, I don't know if anybody's been out testing with them yet. Like I said, we have one going to a customer that races a pretty good bit. We should be at the track reasonably soon. Uh, and get some data off that, and I'll have some feedback. But hopefully so. Hopefully it's a big step in the right direction. Best cam for a 6 Gen A8 without getting a converter. Our Stage 1 would be the only one I would recommend. Um, or our No Chopo, which is basically our Stealth Idle cam. Um, any camshaft, really any camshaft would be beneficial with a converter. Even the factory camshaft would be beneficial with a converter. And the best running combo, if you had a stage one cam with a stock converter or a bolt-on car with a converter, the bolt-on car with the converter is going to be faster than the cam car with no converter. It's just a trade-off. You're always going to bleed off a little bit of low-end torque. Um, so the converter setup is always going to 60 foot better. Sure, you're going to pick up some mile per hour because of the horsepower you pick up with the camshaft, but that doesn't always equal to improve elapsed time because the acceleration curve is going to be different. Um, should I get a smart board installed on? Oh, should get a smart board installed on your wall and take those Q&As to another level? Yeah, we've got some ideas on... Uh, this is just the infancy of doing these Q&As. We were actually talking before uh, the Q&A about some other things we want to try to implement along the way as we get you know better planned and, and everything with these things, so... Uh, should be some good things coming for sure. These Q and A's are great. You should put them on your YouTube if feasible. You can become like all the big YouTubers and start doing head cam package giveaways. Ugh. Yeah. We got to YouTube. Look, bro, YouTube's gonna have to generate some bucks before we can start giving away head cam packages. But you help me, you help me get to where we can monetize our videos and have a million views a month. I promise you, I'll start the giveaways as soon as that happens. I promise. Dual springs or no springs. <laughs> An anti-low lift camera is in here. 
It's also Skyler, the guy that doesn't have a retainer plate or bolts. Anti low lift. Yeah, he's anti low lift. Anti low lift. He's anti cam right now because he can't even put his car together. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> preferred stall for four sixteen high ram cheater cam. Um, I may or may not know the specs of your four sixteen cheater cam, so it's hard to say without knowing that. Um, Something I would typically do on a cheater cam setup would probably have a high ram on it or an MSD. So I would say in the five thousand range minimum. I wouldn't I wouldn't start below five thousand on the converter. I appreciate you guys' hard work and helping people get what they want performance wise. It's always been our number one goal. Hey, uh, you know, so. And, and and I think we're blessed to have you know a bunch of guys on the team like you know like like Ryan and, and, and Ben and a lot of the guys that you've probably encountered that you know we don't just do this to make a living we do it because it's something we're passionate about just just like just like you guys and and I think it's what uh, what makes it work is that you know we don't have to drag ourselves out of bed every day and say oh my God I got to go to work uh, yeah. you know we get excited about coming to work and what's going to be the next project and what's going to be the next frontier we tackle and. We've been, uh, you know, really enthusiastic about uh, the LT platform. You know, we've worked on that now for a couple of years, developing products and pushing the limits on those things. And we think there's a lot of goodness left in the uh, left in the LT platform. We're really excited to get some some more uh, some more fuel components so we can really start leaning on those things. I think it's yeah. going to be, you know, we're starting to get we got a couple of those engines now. Uh, we're working on for some, for some class racing that I think is going to be interesting to see how they compete with some of the current platforms. Yeah. So. Excited about that. Are those two going to be in the same class? Uh, yeah, well, actually, the NA motor. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're yeah. Going be, yeah, they're going to be competitive. We've got a couple of guys in the same class. Yeah, we're going to, that we're building they're, for. They're, now I can already hear. One's going to outrun the other. They're and, friendly yeah. rivals, so it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's going to be fine. Yeah, so, uh, you know, you know, to add on what Aaron was saying, you know, we always wanted to provide a level of service that was extraordinary for the industry that, that fell in line with the level of performance we wanted to provide for people. It's kind of hard to get both sometimes. And it's been very challenging as we've grown to uh, to be able to keep up with the demand. So we certainly appreciate all you guys because we couldn't do what we do without you guys. No really. without question. And I'll, and I'll, I'll, you know, while I have an audience, I'll apologize for any customer service issues that you may have encountered. I know it's sometimes difficult to get through to us on the phone, our phone lines are just are, are buried, and yeah. and uh, we only have a limited you know limited amount of people to uh, uh, to man those things. So we've the live chat. I think has helped. If any of you have tried the live chat feature, that yeah, seems on the website to be, that seems to be really effective. We're trying to uh, service service the customers there, and and uh, we're trying to do a better job with uh, providing information on you know tracking information on the shipments and and uh, making sure that we define if it's a drop shipped item, you know. It's it's just uh, there's a lot of moving parts to this business, and it, you know it's if it was easy, everybody'd be doing it. That's right. <laughs> and we're not only are we a performance retailer, but we also are a full install shop slash fabrication slash tuning yeah. slash machine shop engine build shop. Yeah, so, so we have yes, yeah, so we have a manufacturing arm. We have a you know a full service shop, and and then obviously the tuning component, and then we're you know we, we, you know, we sell parts e commerce business. So. Yeah. It's kind of a challenging thing. Yeah. But a lot of times the shop operation is, you know, we kind of think about that a little bit like a self-sustaining marketing department because a lot of the things we learn, a lot of the product development comes mm -hmm. out of the builds we're doing for you guys. And yeah, for sure. With your cooperation and, and, and enthusiasm, you know, we get a we get a we get to sometimes test some some new ideas, some new yeah. concepts, and push the limits because you guys want to push it, and we have the opportunity to help with that, and and at the same time uh, come up with something that's going to work for the. Uh, you know, for other enthusiasts, so yep. it's a it's it's a good it's a good relationship when it works that way. For sure, Daniel says really enjoying the Q and A's. Goody, what's up, Ryan? Goody. Aaron, four fifty four for the win. Hey man, that thing is coming along nicely. We yeah. ran into one little snag with the uh, uh, the cam carrier on that thing. Is uh, for the LSX uh, for the LTR block is different than for the uh, a stock block or, or a dart. There's one bolt hole moved, and unbeknownst to uh, to us when, when that, that component came in and we're like, well, something's wrong here. So we were able to get a hold of Jessel and, and get the right component going. That's the only thing we're tied up right now on, on Goody's end deal. And that, that thing's gonna be a that's gonna be a nasty war right there. Nice. Uh, Mike, I've been 134, 135 with my 10 speed with a 3X 287 converter and they're high stall now, but I can't remember the part number. Yeah, it was mentioned in the chat earlier. It was a 4X 
363 or something like that. I can't, but uh, I'm anxious to see what the actual flash speed is on that. He said, auto's on save the day, Skyler. <laughs> uh, well, I'll have to make a bunch of bot accounts. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Make a bunch of bot accounts. Go to YouTube. You know, we need we need about, I don't know, a couple mil subscribers. We need about, yeah. you know, a million plus views on every video we put up. And, I, hey, that's all it takes, and we can get some giveaways going, I promise. Yeah. Any update on the bull? Yeah, it's sitting in the same spot it's been sitting for a little over a year, about a year and two or three months. It, uh... I don't know. Maybe I'll do something one one of these days with it. Know, we'll see. It'll probably be out later this year, if all goes well. Chris McCabe. Hey, Aaron. Good to see you. Hey, Chris. Uh, Andrew says, uh, GPI at top tier products and at people. So, try to yeah, we try to try to do both. Norm Molina, you guys do a great job. I placed an order earlier this week, and it already shipped, including my only cams shirt. My heads are on their way. There we go. Perfect. Uh, more Spintron content in the future. Yeah, so we have, like, a, a whole Spintron deal. That Have we even released that yet? The Nike deal? Uh, I think we put something out there, didn't we? We put the video out, but I don't think we have the product page up yet. No, I don't think we do have the product page. So... But, yeah, so as we uh, as we continue to uh, to push forward with uh, development on different valve train systems and stuff, we we certainly anytime we have a new uh, product idea, you know, obviously we're gonna you know do the testing to back up and make sure durability is there for you guys. And we're building a new, uh, we're actually uh, constructing a new engine dyno cell, and I'm gonna try to. It's, it's really gonna be you know a pretty pretty top tier deal, and I want to have a lot of additional. Uh, data acquisition uh, equipment in there so we'll be able to do more you know high level testing I've, I've got dreams of eventually you know having summer pressure transducers and some things like that we just we just got to you know do that as we can yeah. but the, the dyno cells the construction is done on the actual on the actual building and uh, we're currently installing a new power mark dyno so that's going to give us some opportunity i think to yeah. maybe create some some educational content and you know yeah. so it's either educational or it's entertaining and uh so i figure we either have an opportunity to try to learn something and share it or just blow some shit up and so you know it'd be entertaining so one way or the other it'll, it'll maybe work out reminds me of the early days <laughs> You know, you Without get, an engine, you get, I know. You get, you, get, you, get, you get more views if you, if you put yeah, out something where I you, just you need know, to. I look at some of the stuff that gets the most loads. views. I'm like, wow, yeah. I could have been doing this a long time ago. We need to bring a, get a ricer motor in there and spin it about 20,000. Oh, and yeah. scatter and it'll get millions and millions no of followers. Doubt. No doubt. So. Uh, yeah, so more Spintron content. Yeah, and more probably more engine dyno content as we get our new uh, you know, room completed and, and get going on that. But, you know. Data acquisition is huge, like Aaron was talking about. We already on the engine dyno, we always run our eight wide bands. You'll be surprised to see some of these intake manifolds, what goes on from cylinder to cylinder. Yeah. And on your car with a factory computer with one exhaust wide band or one wide band and one exhaust collector, you see an average of what's happening on that side of the engine. And dude, I'm telling you, there are some intakes that one cylinder at wide open throttle may be 14 to one air fuel and the other one may be on the other corner, maybe eleven to one, and that's on a that's on a port fuel injected intake. I mean, it's crazy on a carburetor deal. You see, yeah. carburetors are all over the map. I've had them eleven to one on one hole, and you know, fifteen to one on another. But on uh, even on port fuel injection, we see you know we see you know over a point of variation cylinder cylinder, and that's all in airflow because you know you're injecting the same yeah. amount of fuel on one of those cylinders unless you alter that in the calibration. And uh, that's so that's that's so much differential we have you know just in just in airflow, and it's not at it's not just cross board. You may have it on, you know, this cylinder's this cylinder's starving a little bit on at this RPM range, and then you move, you know, where the resonance pulses or the frequencies yeah. are changing, and it'll it'll swap swap cylinders on you. So there's stuff going on in an intake manifold that uh, that's really uh, can be baffling. And I mean, a lot of smart guys for a lot of years have been studying this stuff, and and uh, you know, we still haven't figured it all out. It's different on every combination. Well, the story is you can't. Uh you can't figure it out if you don't know what's happening. So right. data acquisition is certainly key. 
uh, top tier for sure. Y'all did an amazing job on my engine. You know, 427 we did for him, sent over to uh, Daniel Wolf. Daniel, uh, Daniel yeah. you were. Hey, I'll download your engine, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, he downloaded your engine. He's stateside <laughs> now, so he's 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 back oh, stateside. Nice. So yeah, yeah, it was a nice power plane. Um, let's see. A bit late as always. What time is it, uh, Constantine, over in Poland? Um, it's probably about nine or ten o'clock at night, I would assume. Funny fact, I visited you guys more when I lived in South Texas than now that I live two hours away. I hope to get to see you. Yeah, I know. No joke. Yeah, come by anytime. We'll, we'll go have lunch for sure. Um, so what did you guys think of the blue tape? <laughs> I got a laugh out of it. You know, I, I know the backstory on all the painter's tape, so um, I got a kick out of it. You know, some of the people in parts that, that aren't as connected to what goes on with, with some of the stuff may not have been, but yeah. <clears throat> you know, and we were goofing because, uh, you know, one of our sixth gen competitors always ribs us about weight reduction. But so I, I shared a picture one day of Camaro Fest back in like 2018 when the uh, said competitors, customers were running uh, corrugated plastic with blue painters tape for trunk lids on their car to save a few pounds. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so this whole blue painters tape now, the whole thing is like going, going crazy. I, that's what I should have put on a shirt. I should have put two strips of blue painters tape. Uh, I'm gonna make a killing. Been an instant millionaire. Random question: Do the shirts fit bigger, more loose, or tighter in general? Wanting to order a few. So they're sixty. Uh, depending on the color, they're either fifty fifty poly cotton blend or sixty five thirty five cotton poly blend. So they will shrink very very little. Um, I would say they fit a little, they won't shrink near as much as 100% cotton. So um, probably a little looser once you've washed and dried them versus just a typical 100% cotton. Uh, good question. I was wanting to order one also. Um, Ryan just makes them look tight. I just wear small shirts. I just wear small shirts. I still weigh 150 pounds. I just wear smalls. <laughs> it's just like it's just like horsepower. You got to work at it, man. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. It's 11 p.m. There. Wow. I would be. I would have been asleep for at least an hour, probably. Yeah. Daniel says here in Arizona now. Uh, need to make the trip out. Well, I don't know if you know. You need to make the trip, or we need to make the trip. Well, I made that trip last year. Let me tell you, that, you was, drove, a long, that you, was a long drive. You drove it. Justin and I flew into flew into Vegas drive. and cruised down to Lake Havasu in the, in the rental. When we left Lake Havasu after our Spintron <laughs> testing for two or three days, my youngest daughter had to be back at school like the day after we were leaving. You know, we left at like six o'clock one night. Drove all night. Drove basically between me and Joni. We swapped driving we drove straight back like 22 or 23 hours it was absolutely miserable <laughs> i sent i actually sent aaron a text a screenshot a picture i was coming into amarillo texas right at sunrise as i thought about the song amarillo, amarillo by morning you know when i was like yeah. i'm rolling into amarillo and it's sunrise so uh is there a lot of power to be gained to equalizing air fuel with bungs in each exhaust port uh a lot is relative but you know, we, even we, if you pick up 10 or 15 horsepower, think about how much healthier the engine is going to be long-term durability. Yeah. We have found, we have found some, some horsepower in, in, in certain engines uh, by equalizing that. Actually, the engine I worked on yesterday, I, I had to move, I had to move some cylinder, cylinder fuel, fuel around. It was poor fuel injected. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, it had a couple of cylinders that were lean at idle and fat in the middle and, just looked it out pretty good. And you can certainly do that cylinder to cylinder correction in factory computers that need it. But manifolds like our CID um, or like the Holly High Ram, most of the plastic manifolds, they don't typically have a ton of variance, uh, especially the, the long runner plastic manifolds are generally very good. Yeah. The, so the carbureted style manifolds are the ones that struggle with yeah. unequal runner lengths. Where you have varying runner lengths yeah. from the corners to the centers, mm -hmm. you will have some disparity there. You can still adjust that with tables in the tune, but you don't have the, uh, the adjustability to do it by RPM range. Really. You only have, uh, 
if you're going to adjust that cylinder, it's going to be pretty much through the entire yeah, RPM blow, blow, cover. Yeah. Blow, yeah. So. See, I'm the I'm the Holly tuner, so I'm I'm spoiled. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I do Holly, Ryan. Nobody wants OE. to, and I want to do Holly too, but somebody's <laughs> got to do the OE computer still. And so. I refuse. Yeah, he refuses. So he he outranks me. So I would, what? A, I, I would. I wouldn't be able to. I wouldn't be able to do it if I had to anymore. <laughs> I've been out of the salon. Uh, he said, "All I know is the GPS shirts fit nice." Uh, <laughs> take a trip to Moab, Utah. Have you been there? I have drove through Moab, and uh, we've got some guys that are doing those. Uh, uh, what are the Ultra Four? Ultra Four. Yeah, yeah. the uh, got Ultra Four. Got the off-road Ultra stuff. Four. Yeah, I got a couple Ultra Four racers now that we're doing some engines for. So they they go out there and uh, they do that West Texas deal and. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's, that's neat. That's yeah. neat stuff. Uh, Daniel, we still doing Vegas? Yeah, I just got to talk Joni into the, the kid-free weekend where we can fly out, like, on a Friday and spend a, a couple days and fly back and get a, get a Vegas trip. I want to check out the, the Sphere uh, in Vegas. I want to check that out. You know, I don't even know that that was a thing when we were there. Or they didn't, must not have had it done and operational when we went through there. I don't know. We we. we... We weren't. We got our rental car and uh, we grabbed a bite of lunch. And I, <laughs> got the heck I, out of there. I got, I got out of Vegas while I still had my wallet. <laughs> Just finished working on the motor. <laughs> yeah, late nights, baby. Twenty nine hundred pound car, five hundred fifty wheel, four L eighty versus turbo three fifty. How much difference do you think it would make? I think the turbo three fifty would be at least a tenth faster. I would uh, concur. Uh, you're so you've got a two fifty two low gear versus a two forty eight, which isn't drastically different but the the one two gear split is also better okay. by a little bit on the turbo 350 i think it's close and the overall rotating mass is yeah substantial so less. goody like on the turbo 350 that was in my car that uh, is in Corey's now that thing weighed uh with a factory bell housing which i cut off and put a, a ultra bell on it or ati bell or whatever um, it weighed like a hundred pounds, one hundred and five pounds, or something like that. So just weight alone, it's lighter than the than the four L eighty. But rotational mass, it's going to be way lighter than a four L eighty. So it's definitely going to be faster. Which you know, which it's it's interesting how that impacts parallel. Remember when we changed harmonic balancers on my on, engine? On, 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 yeah, I was on that stock, that first stock bottom end engine, wasn't it? Yeah. Was it was the only yes, one that was in the car yeah. because we tried the vacuum pump. Yeah, we found 10 horsepower just in harmonic pounds or weight. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. Funny, Aaron always gave me the biggest amount of crap for the power bomb balancer. He's like, you need to get that cheap balancer. Oh, man, you need I to put an ATI on there. So we, <laughs> we, we had dynoed it with the power bond with no vacuum pump. And then we took it off and we put the ATI damper on. Because we needed it to adapt our mandrel so we could run an air pump on. Yeah, so we put it. the vacuum pump and we're like, well, there went all the oil pressure, so we're going to take the vacuum pump back off. And then we dynoed it with the ATI on it and we were down power. I'm like, where did the power go? What the heck? We hurt the motor. Did we hurt it when we, we lost it? We changed the damper back. Power it came back. back. <laughs> so, it was about 10 numbers. I was amazed. Yeah, I was And too. that was the thing. It nega any, any power we made with the vacuum pump was negated by the balance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, if we could have run the vacuum pump with the power bomb, yeah. we'd have probably had a winning combination. Yeah, until until, until the bearings said hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, when's Alex Garcia going to slap some CIDs on? Man, I don't know. This guy went out and set the, the, the stop bottom in C7 uh, naturally aspirated record and don't even have ported heads. He's just out there doing savage stuff right now. So. Reach out to him. We need to, we need to uh, work with him on that. Yeah. Uh, Hear that, if you're in here, Alex, Aaron yeah. said reach out. Reach out. We'll work with you on some, uh, on some CIDs, see how, many, how much we can shave off that number. Yep. I promise you that... That, that's that. Anyway, I'll leave your it. car go fast. It'll go fast. It's gonna go fast. He went nine nine sixty one on his third track outing um, with. They're milled, but they're not ported. Mm -hmm. uh, but factory heads. Well, one of the reasons they went so fast because they're not ported. If they been, if they'd been ported, it'd probably been slower. Yeah, probably <laughs> so. depending on the port. But yeah, and some combinations, you know, the bigger the bigger port volume slows the airspeed and doesn't work for you. That's why we like what we do with the CIDs and recommend them. Yeah, for certain applications. Um, let's see, Robert Gibson, I had them ported and milled, and it sure is worth it on stock casting. Same cam. Uh, it was, it was a question I must have missed up here. 
Uh, I know one of the things we want to, we're, we're working on is we, you know, we don't have all of our seller head offerings on our website and we're working towards trying to create a, uh, some good informational content with each set of seller heads we offer. I yeah. mean, we've got a lineup of both CID and Brodax uh, based and Edelbrock based heads that, you know, you guys don't even know. You guys don't even know about them. I mean, we, yeah. we do them on shop builds and, and engine builds, but we're going to try to get that stuff on the site and uh, get it out there where it's available to you with all the specs. And uh, I think that'll be hopefully, you know, added value for, for the customer and perhaps a little more revenue for us. Yeah, hopefully. But uh, yeah, we have a lot of offerings. So if you guys were working on an engine for you, or you're considering us doing an engine for you, um, just visit with us. We, we've got tons of options to, uh, to, to outfit you with the right product for, for what you're trying to do, you know? And, and that's the thing. And, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And, yeah. and at any time, if you're, you know, if you're a vendor or you're, you know, you're, you're trying to run a, uh, you know, a business, you want to try to, uh, limit your SKUs, make it, uh, less to inventory, less to manage, less to keep up with. But when you do that, you know, you're always going to compromise on the end product for the customer because one size really doesn't fit all. I mean, different cross sections for different uh, cubic inch engines, different RPM ranges would call for different different things. You know, it, there's just so many variations in cellar heads, and that's where all the power is at. So getting the induction system right, getting the camshaft right, you know, all the valve events right, you know, that's how that's 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 when the magic happens. And and uh, you know, there's just so many compromises out there that are made. And we, we we're a little bit stubborn. We we hate compromises, so we end up with probably an abnormal amount of products. And and again, we don't we don't do a great job getting them to market. We just kind of have them on the shelf, and we know about them. Yeah. <laughs> we got to do a better job yeah. communicating that. I mean, ultimately, we're we're really we're a small business, guys. We're 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 small business. We're we're burning at both ends. So. To try to try to get stuff done. We've got some cool offerings. We're gonna continue doing a better job getting that stuff out there for you guys. You know yeah. what the heck we actually offer. Yeah, and, and hopefully, and, and I, I guess we can disclose a little bit of that. But what Ryan and I were talking about earlier, and, and this was Ryan's idea, and I think it was a great idea, is that you know we want to take this Q and A stuff and maybe start partnering up with some of our vendors and some of the some of the folks that we work with, and try to get some guests to come on and answer questions. Like, you know, it would be great if we could get you know maybe somebody from Circle D, get Chris or somebody, and then. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity there and about, you know, sharing information, sharing good information, sharing accurate information, not just, uh, you know, getting on our, running our mouth, trying to make ourselves yeah. feel better. We, we really want to try to, you know, uh, you know, elevate everybody's level of play. Yeah. And that's the end goal. So, you know, I mean, we, we lean on our, our vendors we deal with for our products. We lean on those guys, you know, to, for, for the stuff we do, you know, I mean, Circle D does every, gen, just literally about every converter, if not every converter that we do nowadays. And, um, you know, they're the authority on it. Yeah, they know what's going on. I mean, I know the parts inside a converter, but. We've, we've been with those guys since they were a little bitty. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we started out with Circle D. Kind of grown together. They have, yeah. So, anyways, yeah, moving forward, we'll try to get some, uh, some of our, um, some of our comrades in here that we work with on a daily basis to, to help uh, spec our products and help build our products for us uh, to talk in, in, in more detail, more detail than I can talk about my own, you know? So that would be really good. You're coming up, uh, I think, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have uh, Bill Alexander with Driven Oil is gonna come over and, and uh, we're gonna put on a little uh, lubrication seminar so we'll try to catch that on video and, and push that out there so for it's sure available to everybody as well i think yep. that, you know motor is pretty important if you're you know building performance vehicles so and driven is our go-to oil should, for should be a good for, for most all of our applications except yeah. for maybe the turbo alcohol stuff we run some shafers but driven is most of all of our street strip and um oils that we choose that's what we stock here so it'd be good to, to to delve into that and get more detailed information about the oils and why they're formulated just the way they are for these applications yeah exactly because i think oil is a whole lot like you know everybody's got a brand favorite and well, my daddy ran quaker state so i'll run quaker state and that's the best i don't know why i have no idea what the chemical makeup is or why it's that way but i just think it is and i think that's kind of <laughs> yeah. the way motor oil works you know i had you know i ran pins oil and i never i never lost a bearing well hell there you go i mean that's that's proof but uh, we want to dig a little deeper and yeah look and in, look into the to the to the reasons and the science and the chemistry yeah uh what year did you guys start uh down at the old shop i think my first trip was back in 2018 2019 i guess you started around the fifth gen 
Yeah, well, I mean, 2011, it, 12, he started pedaling a little bit. You know, I started in spring of 2012. Yeah, uh, but you guys were doing it. Had a dyno yeah, there before yeah, then. Maybe ten, maybe ten or eleven. Yeah, ten probably. I don't know. Yeah, I started it back was, in the nineties. It was pre ZL ones. Yeah, I guess it was. Oh, yeah, it was definitely pre ZL ones. Because you were building ZL ones before ZL ones yeah, yeah, were ZL ones. Exactly right. That's where we started. We were doing four sixteen supercharged engines and brand new Camaros. Call them GPI seven fifties. That's kind of was the catalyst, and then uh, ZL1 scared me off, so I quit building those cars, and we started just building cars. And then we developed a few products that people wanted, and started filming on a website, and it was a little homemade one, and it wasn't very good, but uh, people started buying stuff, and we said, hey, maybe there's a business here. I think I built I think I built the <laughs> website one weekend on like GoDaddy or something. I, like three to, I don't even know what I'm doing. I just, I don't even know how I got our products on there, but people were buying stuff. There, yeah. I'm like, okay, well. So we've we come a long way. Uh, Constantine wants to know the fastest overall NA engine we've ever built. The fastest or the most power per cubic inch? He said fastest. So what's some of our class NA stuff? I mean, I know moves um, went moves went seven eighties. Yeah, I mean that was on a yeah that was on. A, I mean, there's so many there's so many variables. I mean, we got you get into the class racing. You know, we've got. You know, you're limited to inline head. You're in, you're limited to cubic inch. You know, you're limited to deck height. There's all these limitations on a lot of these classes, so it's kind of a loaded question. But uh, you know, I mean, we've been, uh, you know, we built the engine that uh, uh, Nurse Wander went uh, went into sevens uh, with uh, in uh, NA ten five with that engine, and uh, and the engine was very dependable. It wasn't the fastest in the class, but it didn't break all the time. And it's still running. And uh, we did, uh, you know, Charlie Booz, he, he set some he set some records. And Charlie won, you know, back in, uh, you know, when Jim was live, uh, I think they had like five national championships. He was uh, running the NMRA deal right there at the end of the tenure with that car. Yeah. He was basically the only naturally aspirated car in the class running with some other power adder yeah. cars. And at the time, Actually, I think he was going 780s. Yeah. We're actually doing uh, doing some pro project with Charlie right now on a uh, Godzilla engine. So we're developing, you know, we develop you know, Coyote and, and, and we're really working on the Godzilla platform because we like that. We like that platform. It's a it's a neat pro it's a neat engine. It's kind of like an LS. It's a lot like a big cubic inch LS on steroids with yeah. a big old steel block, and you can make five hundred well, four hundred ninety four inches with that one on a stock block. We'll start <laughs> we'll start Godzilla swapping all of our LS vehicles in. <laughs> it's a cool power plant, it really is. Um, but as far as power per cubic inch, the most power I've ever made per cubic inch is uh, uh, two point three eight per cubic inch naturally aspirated. And the strange thing about that is that was that's a full out, all out candid splay valve race engine, you know, one one oh twenty lift on the on the cam and and uh, you know twelve hundred pounds of spring pressure over the nose. I mean, we're talking about a high maintenance, all out, wound tight, you know, ten thousand RPM race motor, two point three eight per cubic inch. Uh, what our stock bottom end made? We, we, yeah, our stock bottom end made uh, made. 2.35, <laughs> with a hydraulic cam. So that's, yeah, with a hydraulic roller, uh, you know, 800 lift. So, you know, DI, DI fascinates me. It's, yeah. uh, it's fascinating. So. John said, what's the quickest uh, that the LS or LT4, LT1 have been sealed engine, but with a power adder, Jeff thinks that Brett had a bolt on customer with a 6 Gen seal when it went 890s. Uh, yeah, 890s is what I've seen. If it's stock heads and stock cam, um, you know, somebody people's interpretations of bolt-ons may vary. But, yeah, that's our target. Uh, whatever that number is, faster than that is what our target is with Jeff's car. And, you know, from Jeff was, Tyndall was one of our early fifth gen, you know, guys from the forum from way back when. I mean, he's probably been working with us for 10 years. Yeah. Or better, um, he's got a ZL1 up here now, and we're doing some stuff, uh, some blower stuff. So we're 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 seeing, uh, we're we're gonna see how fast we can go. You you probably didn't have uh, optical aids or a gray beard back when Jeff started doing business with us, did you? No, I, I had I had I had none of that and a lot more patience and sanity. So a lot of things have changed since then. So uh, anyways. What's up, Zach? Uh, anyways, guys, well, we smoked about an hour and a half today. It's been a good chat. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um, I'm going to get this thing scheduled. We'll, we'll try to put something out and, and choose a topic for next week's live. It'll be 3 p.m. on Wednesday again. 
and we'll figure out what that topic's going to be. I'll try to get it scheduled by Friday or, or Monday morning. That way we've got some lead time to plan to be in there. Uh, we appreciate all you guys for tuning in. And uh, you have any closing comments? Thank you for your support. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you for uh, your involvement with our business. And uh, let's, uh, let's keep on going fast. Let's thank go. You. 2024. Let's kill it. See you next time.